Hi, my name is Dave. Today we're going to look at the classic C8 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. They started making these in around the 1970s or so, and they are very, very popular. You can buy them commonly on the used market with no problem. Stay tuned to the end of the video, and I'll show you how I brought this scope into the 21st century with some modern technology. The very earliest versions of this had a blue and white color scheme. Uh, if you ever see one of those, those are marvelous looking telescopes. It's hard to duplicate the features of a C8. A lot of aperture in a very small compact package does the job, does the job nicely. So schmidt cassegrain telescopes are obviously compromises. All telescopes are compromises one way or another. You're either going to compromise in price or quality or size or something. The C8 is a very sweet compromise. It's got some really nice things in a compact package. This telescope is 1978 vintage. And in those days, they thought it was really cool to put a 6x30 finder on a big scope like this. <laughs> uh, it works okay for finding things like the moon, <laughs> uh, Jupiter. It's not bad. The little 6x30 finder here is uh, really almost inadequate for the scope but it does have the advantage that it allows it to swing between the arms like so uh, so for clearance issues you can leave their finder attached and it won't run into the fork arms and it also makes it possible to put it into a trunk this also has the piggyback camera adapter you can see here that's an option that you could get for it one of the Probably the few success, successful ways you could do astrophotography with this scope was piggyback like this. Because the tracking is accurate enough, if you polarize pretty closely, you could take an exposure here with a wide angle lens for 15-20 you know, minutes, this is back in the day of film. And it would probably turn out pretty okay, you wouldn't have too bad at trailing errors. Uh, mounting, a, mounting a camera on the back of the scope is possible, I'll show you that. This is, of course, a standard inch and a quarter visual back. Put on a nice big two inch star diagonal if you want. Giant eyepiece of some sort. This kind of photography is going to be very challenging though because you've got a lot of focal length there. 2,000 millimeters of focal length is a whole lot. Very difficult to get any kind of decent tracking with this focal length. Maybe best for um, planetary or lunar photography, you could take some quick snapshots. Another accessory you could use with this telescope is a rotating turret. This happens to be by me, but Celestron had the same thing. You put four eyepieces in there and then rotate it around. If you're going to do astrophotography with this scope, back in the day, you put your camera on there, make sure it's loaded up with film. Then use this kind of device. This is a, an inverter, an old-fashioned one. This is one that I made. You plug the scope into the back of that. This gives you a variable frequency. It varies slightly from 60 hertz to, I don't know, maybe 55 to 65, something like that, by tuning that dial. This plugs into a 12-volt source of some sort, usually a car battery. Uh, there used to be a hand paddle to go with this, but I've since lost it over the years. That's how you would do uh, astrophotography, at least one way. Remember, back in those days, there was no stacking or anything. You had to take your shots one at a time, and there would be long exposures, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that. This scope has what I would call very basic, uh, but workable uh, kind of mechanism for the mount. This is your lock for the declination. So you lock it down there, and then you have this, which gives you a little bit of tangent. There's a tangent arm right down here. There's a little bit of tangent motion you get from that. It's enough. It's plenty. So that's how that works. Right ascension is like so. This thing is a spur gear. You turn it like this for slow motion. You could lock it onto the clock drive like that. And then it would, and you could also adjust the tension here. You would actually drive it with the tension slightly adjusted so that we could track smoothly. Here's how you set your setting circle. 
set that to the right ascension and then it would follow the, it would move right along with the clock drive after you set it, so it was very useful. The plug for the clock drive, here's the clock drive plug right there. This is um, no longer used, so it's hard to get these. Anyway, you plug that right in there, and this goes into standard AC outlet. My, how things have changed in the last 50 years, huh? When you look at these two things next to each other, you can see a clear family resemblance. They're both orange, and they both are 8-inch bit Cassegrain telescopes. Uh, so the basic optical package here is identical. There's a slight difference because the coating has been improved, um, but I can't see it very much difference through the eyepiece. It, the dramatic changes, of course, are down below on the mounts. This has a fork equatorial mount. This has a single arm fork Altaz mount. When this one was new, it sold for less than $1,000. This one is about $1,200. This was as of a couple of years ago. So the price has not kept up with inflation. It also has quite a bit of difference in terms of the functionality. This is, of course, is all electronic go-to. You cannot move this scope manually. The only way you can move it is with the hand paddle. So you use the hand paddle to move it around. This will go any place in the sky. You can, once you get it aligned, it will find things in the sky. That's very, very nice. It'll go wherever you want. This one, you're stuck with the <laughs> 6 by 30 finder in your setting circles. And good luck, buddy, because <laughs> you're going to have some challenges. This one has its challenges also, of course. So this has its advantages. Um, but other than that, they're almost identical telescopes. The standard SE mount with this has quite a few limitations. So I decided to upgrade. I can use the electronics on this scope along with the electronics in this very fancy eyepiece to do deep sky observations from a very light polluted backyard. See my video linked in the description. This is an image intensifier attached to a very large eyepiece and this goes into this super large diagonal here. The image intensifier is very expensive so I like to protect, make sure it's not going to hit the ground in any way by looping this over like that and keep it safe. So now I've got the image intensifier on the scope. That really improves what I can see with the scope. I've also got the app, the StarSense app, loaded on my phone. Um, and the phone made a simple adapter here. This adapter just goes right on here. It holds the phone and has a mirror here. This is just an inch and a half elliptical diagonal I had laying around. I used some uh, silicone adhesive to attach it to a piece of bent aluminum. There's a phone clamp that I bolted on there, and this is a Vixen style finder dovetail. So this goes on there. Now I operate the telescope as an Altaz telescope. I need the counterweight here to counterbalance all the extra weight I've got back here. Now I've got a really nice deep sky telescope. I can find things very quickly with the StarSense app. The Venerable C8 has a very, very long and illustrious history. Uh, there was a brief time during the 1980s, Halley's Mania, when the optics weren't good, but this one here is beautiful, superb. My later version, uh, one I bought a couple of years ago, is also superb. Um, I don't know how they managed to do it, but they can still make a really fine telescope for just right around a thousand dollars. The uh, telescopes are just simply wonderful, even with all the iterations and all the different colors and different configurations they came with. The basic C8 is still a kind of a workhorse of astronomy.
I hope you've enjoyed having a look at the classic Celestron CA telescope. Thank you for watching.